Hello, this is going to be uh, another lecture uh, of AE4520 Advanced Structural Analysis. And we're not going to discuss much structures today in this lecture. We are going to just recall some of the mathematics that we will need through the course. The learning objectives for this lecture are all of the recall type. So we just recall symmetric and schoosymmetric parts of the matrix, positive and semi-positive definite matrices, how to transform components of a spectrum from one set of orthogonal axes to another. We also will discuss rotation matrices and orthogonality, discuss a little bit the eigenvalue problem, and finally uh, talk about how a tensor is transformed between two sets of axes, where by tensor here, uh, we just mean second order tensors, which are represented as matrices. So the first thing we're going to uh, discuss is symmetric and non-symmetric parts of a square matrix. So a matrix A is essentially an array or a list of numbers which are arranged in rows and columns. So elements can be written as E12, E, sorry, E11, E12, E13, E21, E22, E23, and this can go on in all directions to any size, and this can be n by n. So this is a general form of a square matrix. So a standard operation on matrices is to rotate kind of the matrix. So you replace columns by rows and rows by columns. When you do that, this process is called transpose, and this leads to another matrix called a transpose. And a transpose will have the components. a11 will remain as is, but then you will put a21, a31. Then here, you will get a12, a22. E32, and this also again continues in all directions. If the original matrix is square, then the transpose will also be E square matrix. So in components, we can write that E transpose IJ equals A I. J I sorry. Uh, let me delete this. So that's the definition of the transpose. A matrix is called symmetric if A equals A transpose. We call it symmetric. And we call it school or anti-symmetric if A equals minus A transpose. So we call it anti or school symmetry. Very well. So now, 
what if the matrix is not symmetric or skew symmetric? In general, we can write a matrix, a general square matrix, as a sum of a symmetric part with a score of B and a skew symmetric part with a score of C. If we transpose both sides, we'll find that A transpose will be equal to B transpose plus C transpose. Since B is symmetric, B transpose is equal to B. And since C is school symmetric, C transpose is equal to minus C. Adding and dividing by 2, we get that B is nothing other than the average of A and A transpose. And subtracting and dividing by 2, we find that C is nothing other than A minus A transpose over 2. As such, we can write any matrix as the sum of a symmetric and uh, skew symmetric parts and this is just about it as far as symmetry and skew symmetry is concerned. For your, let's say, mental stimulation, it would be nice to show that for a skew symmetric matrix, the, all the diagonal elements are zero. So wouldn't be a bad idea to spend some time trying to show that. Now we come to the definition of positive definite and positive semi-definite matrices. In order to do that, we start by defining what we people call quadratic forms. And this takes the form Q of X, where X is a vector, equals X transpose A X, where A is a square matrix. So for each square matrix, we can associate a corresponding quadratic form. What happens if A happens to be a skew symmetric matrix? So if A is skew symmetric. What goes on? Q is a scalar, so the transpose of a scalar is the same value. So we can write Q equals X transpose A X. And then if we transpose that, we get X transpose E transpose, and then X transpose transpose, which is X. But since we assume that A is already skew symmetric, we, then we can write this as minus X transpose A X, which is equal to minus Q. Q equals minus Q, this tells us that Q is identically zero for all values of X. So if you have a skew symmetric matrix, the corresponding quadratic form is exactly zero. Since we already have shown that a general matrix can be split into two parts, a symmetric part and a skew symmetric part, and since the skew symmetric part will have always a zero quadratic form, then we, instead of thinking about quadratic forms as associated with square matrices, we can really limit ourselves only to symmetric matrices. So we will work only with quadratic forms, which are based on symmetric matrices A. And the way it works is that for each symmetric matrix, there is a unique quadratic form, and for each quadratic form, there is a unique symmetric matrix. So there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between quadratic forms and 
symmetric matrix. Good. So now, for um, for quadratic forms, we say that Q is positive definite if Q of X is larger than zero for all X not equal to zero. Of course, if X is equal to zero, then Q is zero. If for any other non vector which is non zero, Q is positive, then we call it positive definite. We call Q to be positive semi definite. When Q of X is greater than or equal zero for all X not equal zero. Actually, we can remove not equal zero, but just to clarify here that it can be zero for non zero vectors X, some non zero vectors X. Okay, so since we said that. For each quadratic form, there is a symmetric matrix, and for each uh, symmetric matrix is a quadratic form, then a symmetric matrix A is positive definite if X transpose the X, which is the corresponding quadratic form, is always positive for all non-zero vectors. And a square symmetric matrix is positive semi definite if the corresponding quadratic form is greater than or equal to zero for all non zero vectors x. So this defines positive definite matrices and positive semi definite matrices which will be used quite often in uh, in our work the next point to recall is uh, how to transform vectors between two sets of mutually orthogonal axes. For simplicity, we work in 2D, but of course, everything can be easily generalized to multiple dimensions. So let's say that we have two sets of two coordinate axes here, X and Y, that we want to use to solve a problem. And then someone else decided to describe the same physical problem, but in a different set of axes, which are also mutually orthogonal, but they are inclined with respect to X and Y, and that person called these axes X prime and Y prime. So the trick here is that if we have a vector V, that vector may be represented either in the axes X prime and Y prime, as components along X prime and Y prime, or as components along X and Y. So for now, let us think about unit vectors along X and Y and call them E2 and E1. So E1 is a unit vector along X axis, E2 unit vector along Y axis. And let us correspondingly have E1 prime and E2 prime to be unit vectors along the X prime axis and Y prime axis. So a vector V can be represented in two different ways. It can be represented as V1 E1 plus V2 E2 which would be 
the components along E1 and E2. Or the same vector can be represented as components along E1 prime and E2 prime. Okay, so now these are the same vector. They represent the same physical reality. So we can equate them. And what we can do is after equating them, we can take the dot product first with E1, so E1 dot E1 is 1, E1 dot E2 is 0, so we will get V1 equals V1 prime E1 prime dot E1 plus V2 prime E2 prime dot E1 and similarly we have V2 equals V1 prime E1 prime dot E2 plus V2 prime E2 prime dot E2 which we can write this as a metric representation so we can write this as V1 V2 equals a 2 by 2 matrix R times V1 prime V2 prime where the matrix R really represents the cosines of the angles between the different axes. So R11 is the cosine of the angle between X prime and X. E12 is cosine of the angle between Y prime and X, and so forth and and so on. So this matrix is called a rotation matrix. because it represents the relationship between coordinates, the components of a vector in two sets of axes which are related by the rigid rotation. So one set of axes is just rotated from the other set uh, of axes. It's not difficult to see that R transpose R will be equal to a unity matrix and this means that if we post multiply by R inverse that R transpose will be equal to R inverse so the inverse of a rotation matrix is equal to the transpose um, another thing if we take the determinant of R transpose R equals unity matrix we get determinant of R transpose, which is determinant of R, determinant of R equals determinant of unity matrix, which is 1. This means that the determinant of the rotation matrix is equal to plus minus 1. And usually we use what we call proper rotations, which always have the determinant of the rotation matrix equal to 1 which makes sure that the new axes are ordered according to the right-hand rule, the same as the original set of axes. From here, we can also write that the components in the new coordinate system are equal to R transpose 
times the components in the original coordinate system. So this way we can transform components from the new coordinate system to the old or from the old coordinate system to the new. The next point that we would like to recall is the properties of the eigenvalue problem. And to start discussing eigenvalue problem, a very easy way for us is to start from what we call Raleigh quotient. And Raleigh quotient is very simply a function which is a ratio of two quadratic forms. Where the super T is for transpose. And we see here that if x is multiplied by a factor, let's say multiply x by a factor of 2, what actually happens is that the numerator will be scaled by a factor of 4, the denominator will also be scaled by a factor of 4, and the ratio between the two will remain the same. So if we want to find the minimum or maximum of f, it would not depend on the vector x, but only in its direction, because we can scale it as much as we like without changing the value of the function f. Another thing is that usually, since we're dividing by x transpose dx, we would like to avoid division by zero, and as such, we assume that b is positive definite. So that we don't have to divide by zero. Of course, the zero vector is not considered in Raleigh quotient, so we, the function is defined for any x which is not zero, any vector x which is not zero. The task is to find the maximum or minimum of f. And in order to do that, one can use differentiation or differentiate with respect to the components of x, if we do that, we find that the vector x that leads to a maximum or minimum of f would satisfy the relation a minus lambda b times x equals 0, where, of course, a and b are matrices, x is a vector, and lambda is some scalar. And in this form, lambda would be the values of lambda that lead to a non-zero solution for x are called the eigenvalues. So lambdas would be eigenvalues and the corresponding vectors x are eigen vectors. What happens is that in the standard eigenvalue value problem, the matrix B is just a unique matrix, which is of course positive definite, and we get A minus lambda I x equals zero, but in general, we can have any positive definite matrix. And uh, there are some properties of this uh, eigenvalue problem is that if A and B are size N, so they are N by N symmetric square matrices, then there are N eigenvalues. 
including repeated eigenvalues. So sometimes the eigenvalues are repeated, but there will always be n of them. The second thing is that there are n eigenvectors. So there will be exactly n eigenvalues and exactly n eigenvectors. The eigenvectors are orthogonal with respect to the A matrix. So if you have two eigenvectors, xi and xj, then xi transpose A xj will be equal to zero if i is not equal to j and xi transpose b xj will be equal to zero when i is not equal to j. Since as we agreed before um, that x is really the only thing that's important is the direction so we can always normalize the vectors such that xi transpose b xi equals 1. And this is always possible because b is a positive definite matrix. And these are the basic properties of this uh, eigenvalue problem. So essentially, Starting from the Raleigh quotient, the directions at which the function f takes maximum or minimum are the eigenvalue condition, which is a minus lambda d times x equals zero. There will be n values of lambda, including repetition, that will lead to non-zero vectors x, and an exactly n eigenvectors. And these eigenvectors can always be chosen such that they are mutually orthogonal with respect to both A and, and B. There are so many pairs of matrices which are interesting structures that appear in a Raleigh quotient form. For example, A can be the stiffness matrix and B can be the geometric matrix, in which case this would represent a buckling problem. Or, for example, A can be the stiffness matrix, B is the mass matrix, in which this would represent a vibration problem, and it leads to the vibration modes and natural frequencies. And there are uh, many other, many other applications. The interesting part is that for the most common case, which is that B equals 1, which is the standard eigenvalue problem. Then we find that the, according to the properties we have listed before, that the eigenvectors are not only mutually orthogonal, but we have unit, unit length. So this means that we can form a rotation matrix R by listing the eigenvectors side by side. So if I put x1, then x2, all the way to xn as columns, then this is going to be a rotation matrix. And we can always order them such that the determinant of R is equal to 1, so it is a proper rotation. This is very, uh, very, uh, very interesting, yeah? So now let us look at uh, what happens to a matrix if we started by a matrix represented in a set of axes and then we wanted to be represented in a new set of axes. So again, we can think about quadratic forms. So if a matrix is represented in certain set of axes, then the quadratic form of that matrix is x transpose 
a x. If we want to represent a in a different coordinate system, we can write also the same quadratic form, which will not change because it is a scalar, in the new coordinate system. So this will be x prime transpose a prime x prime. But from what we know before, we know that x prime is r transpose x. So we can write this as and that x is r times x prime. So we can write q as r x prime transpose a r x prime and this is nothing other than x prime transpose r transpose a r x prime and comparing these two expressions we find here that the matrix A represented in the new coordinate system is nothing other than R transpose A R. Okay, so if we go back to the standard eigenvalue problem where B is a unity matrix, we found that we can form a rotation matrix by taking the eigenvectors and putting them side by side in a matrix. So what would be in that new system of axes? What would be the representation of our matrix A? Very simple. Because of the orthogonality properties of X, of the vectors X with respect to matrix A, we find that A prime will be a diagonal matrix. So, in eigenbasis, which is the coordinate system defined by the eigenvectors, A prime, which is this representation, is diagonal And interestingly enough, the values on the diagonal will be the eigenvalues of the matrix A. So this kind of finishes all the review we want to do of basic facts from linear algebra that we will need uh, in the course. So we started by uh, recalling um, the definition of square matrix, symmetric and anti-symmetric. We showed that any matrix can be split into a symmetric part and anti-symmetric part. From that, we define quadratic forms. We shown the definition of a positive definite and a positive semi-definite matrix. After that, we looked at how to transform the coordinates uh, of a vector from one set of axes to another. This led to rotation matrices. After that, we used quadratic forms to define the eigenvalue problem, and we have seen that for the standard eigenvalue problem, the eigenvectors form an orthogonal basis, so they form a rotation matrix, and that when you represent a matrix in its eigenbasis, it will be diagonal, and it is not difficult to show that the diagonal elements would be the eigenvalues of the matrix. So these facts, which you should know already from linear algebra, will be used quite extensively in our course, so I thought that it wouldn't be a bad idea to review them very quickly, so that we'll, they will be fresh in your mind as we go through uh, through the course. Thank you very much.